you cannot get that rid of them by sweating them out. You cannot get rid of them by urinating them out. So they are not water soluble. So they do not come out in your urine. So they are lipid soluble. So they are stored in the fat. These are not natural, uh, naturally occurring chemicals. These are synthetic. Okay. So some, some examples of these synthetic ones are they have abbreviations, and you might have heard of some of them. So for example, DDT is an example of one. This is actually an example of an insecticide. And what did they spray, or why did they spray DDT like in the 1950s abundantly? What were they trying to get rid of? Mosquitoes, right? So this is an insecticide. There's also a, another one called dioxin. Dioxin is actually a product or a byproduct of um, uh, uh, chlorinating or bleaching uh, paper products. So this is the bleaching of paper products. So things that have been bleached, like white toilet paper, for example, could have dioxin in it but it's released by the factories that are doing the bleaching, so that's dioxin. And then we have PBD. And these are actually um, pollutants that are in the water and they're in sediments. So they're industrial pollutants. So for example, these could be in fish that are in the Columbia River because the in industries along the Columbia River oftentimes release this chemical and then it gets embedded in the sediment. So anytime you mix a sediment up, it can actually get put into the, um, into the uh, algae and then it can magnify as it moves up through the food chain. And then there's another one that is PBDE. So it's like pro polybrominated diethyls or something like, something like that. And PBDE is a flame retardant. So sometimes this is added to carpets. It's also added to foam furniture. It was added and, and fortunately was also added to children's pajamas, but they have subsequently stopped putting them in, in children's pajamas, like the ones that um, could easily catch fire, um, not the cotton ones, but the, the polyester ones. So the question is, is, is that how dangerous are these? Well, if they're persistent, they can accumulate. And actually, one of the interesting things is, is, is that they can be secreted by the mother into the breast milk and they can actually be downloaded into her offspring. So they become concentrated in the breast tissue and um, the mother, they call it downloads chemicals to offspring the uh, breast milk. So they have shown that this can be disadvantaged or a disadvantage because this could actually um, cause a depressed immune system in the babies that are getting the persistent organic pollutants. So the question posed by a lot of people is just that why are we not testing for it? And in other countries, they do monitor the breast milk. 
And so they typically go out and they take samples of, of females' breast milk and then they monitor them for different levels of these chemicals. And then they pass legislation, regulations, um, decreasing the use of these. And what they find is over time, it actually decreases in the milk. So for example, in Sweden, what they have found with the PBDEs is, is that over time, So if we just look at the green one. What happened in the 1990s is we became really um, concerned about fires and things burning up quickly. And so we started adding flame retardants. And what they said found is, is that there was lots of those PBDEs in, um, the, um, uh, in the breast milk. And then they banned it. And what has happened is it has declined over time. So you notice that in Sweden, these have tended to decline over time as they have stopped using them in the environment. So the first thing is to just become aware of, its, of it. And you can, um, here in the United States, I, there are places where you can send your breast milk to see how contaminated it is. And there's still this, this um, general idea that it is still better for especially early breastfeeding um, to breastfeed, even if you do have these pollutants in your body. Um, it's still better and more healthy for the offspring breastfeeding, but it's important to realize that these pollutants don't just go away, but they persist in our body tissues. So it's not just in milk, but it is in other animal fats. Like they discovered orcas that have washed up and they did analysis and they found out that they have lots of organic persistent pollutants in their body fat and their leather. And it just made them very, very ill over time and might have um, subsequently led to their death. So if we look at the other side of that, so under breast milk, we see that there may be concentrated environmental pollutants. Um, if we look at um, the cow's milk formula, it says that processing should reduce or exclude most inorganic contaminants. Now, if you're mixing milk, and let's say that you um, live out somewhere where you have a well, and you're mixing formula, what do you need to be concerned about in your well water in particular? What are you concerned about in the well water? If you're giving it to your babies. It's a nutrient that is normally really important. Calcium or... Um, or uh, it's not calcium, but it's nitrogen, right? So nitrogen So maybe put excessive, right? There's a level Babies in particular So that nitrogen gets there because of fertilizer, right? And so it can leach into the water. It can get into the well water, into the groundwater. And so you wanna make sure that your nitrogen levels are not excessive if you're mixing up the, the milk cow's milk formula. Anything else that anybody is concerned with? Okay, are there any questions about this idea, having persistent organic pollutants? PCBs is another one. So maybe you put PCBs, I put PBDs. But there's another PCBs. PCBs plus PBDs. That's another one you would comment on here. Now there's one that's not organic. What do you have to be concerned about if you eat lots of salmon or lots of tuna? Mercury, right? So mercury is not an organic, persistent organic pollutant because mercury is inorganic. But mercury is another one. And so if you go to the doctor's, um, or like a gynecologist office, you oftentimes see, warning, if you are pregnant, you need to limit your intake of fish in particular because fish have high levels of mercury in them. And then mercury is obviously a neurotoxin, and well, it is a neurotoxin, so it could do damage during pregnancy. So you want to limit the amount of tuna, 
unfortunately, and other types of large fish that bioaccumulate um, toxins in their body. Okay. So let's continue our um, analysis of the eukaryotic cell. So there are other um, structures in here that we have yet to talk about. And one of these is what is referred to as a lysosome. And so the lysosome is really interesting because it is involved in intracellular digestion. So I'll look at some other organelles. Oops. Oops. So anytime you see LYS, that is actually short for lysis, and that is the breaking down. So lysis means to break down. Okay. So means body. So this is the organelle that's involved in intracellular digestion. So we also have extracellular. So in our digestive tract, we release enzymes into the space, we break down the food into smaller and smaller pieces, but ultimately cells have to be able to take that small, small food particle and take it inside and digest it even further. So we have the intracellular digestion. So these contain enzymes. that break down substances. Now remember that enzymes are generally proteins. So proteins are coded for in our genetic material. So we do have some mutations that lead to our inability to break substances down. So some genetic mutations can lead to defective enzymes. So they cannot break them down properly. So in our population, there is a very common genetic mutation, and you're actually tested for it um, upon birth. And does anybody know what is the disease that is caused by that mutation? that everybody has tested for by a prick on the heel. PKU, yes. Okay. So we have what is called the PKU test, right? So PKU is short for um, phenyl, phenyl ketonuria. Okay, I never make you memorize that word. But BKU is the inability to break down phenylalanine, which is an amino acid. so they cannot break down phenylalanine. So this sometimes accumulates inside of their cells, inside of their nervous systems, and it can actually lead to problems in the development of the nervous system. Okay. So it affects development of nervous system. And before we knew about PKU and that it could actually be treated for, by dietary constraint. So when you go to the to the um, to the grocery store, you will sometimes see on uh, foods it will say warning, fetal ketoneurias. This product contains phenylalanine, and the reason for that they tell you that is because you want to avoid excessive phenylalanine because your body cannot break it down, and the um, synthetic artificial sugar that is in like diet foods, aspartame, 
has phenylalanine. So specifically on diet sodas, you'll see, warning, fetal ketoburics, do not drink, right, because it can cause problems. So before we knew that you could actually treat this um, by changing a person's diet, oftentimes people would end up in insane asylums or in state hospitals because uh, just simply they were PKU, we didn't know they were PKU, we didn't even know about PKU, and they, were, they ingested so much when they were young that it affected their nervous system and it's like the lifelong effects of it. We don't have generally have state mental hospitals anymore, but in the past, that's where a lot of PKU people ended up. So this can be treated by changing the diet. So that is just one example of a lysosomal um, mutation that has that can have a dramatic effect on a person's phenotype. Okay, so other things about lysosomes is, is that they are important in cells that are phagocytes. So phagocyte is a, is a cell that can go out and eat other cells. So these are cells that eat microbes and damaged body cells, damaged or old. So for example, your spleen has lots of phagocytes in it because your red blood cells only live about 120 days and then they get worn out. So the, the blood goes into the spleen and these phagocytes, the cells, will just eat the red blood cell and break it down and recycle the components. Like the iron goes to the liver, right? We produce um, uh, some pigments. Um, and so that would be one function of the phagocytes. We also have white blood cells, right? So we have white blood cells that eat bacteria. So if you get a wound, for example, there are white blood cells that leave the circulatory system, go out into the tissues, and start to eat any bacteria that have invaded your body. So white blood cells are examples of phagocytes that use their lysosome, they intracellularly digest the bacteria. So I'm just gonna show you a quick little video that shows a um, white blood cell, a neutrophil, uh, kind of, Hunting down, I guess, a bacteria. It looks like the bacteria is running away from it, but it is just moving away because of molecular um, uh, activity. So the molecules are kind of moving it around. In this spread, a neutrophil is seen in the midst of red blood cells. Staphylococcus aureus bacteria have been added. The small clump of bacteria release a chemoattractant that is sensed by the neutrophil. The neutrophil becomes polarized and starts chasing the bacteria. The bacteria, bounced around by thermal energy, move in a random path, seeming to avoid their predator. Eventually, the neutrophil catches up with the bacteria and engulfs them by phagocytosis. Didn't make that noise for real, but... <laughs> think that was added. Okay. So after it engulfs it, it takes it in and then it uses its lysosomes to digest it. And so that is a one way that the cells can feed upon bacteria. Okay. So here's an example from your book. Here's a piece of food, or in this case, a bacteria that gets taken in, it could be a bacteria. And then the lysosome fuses with it and forms a larger vesicle, and then it breaks it down, and then the waste products can actually be secreted out and be passed out. And so we'll talk about the process of taking things in and passing them out in a little while. Okay. 
Okay, so the last organelle I want to talk about are the mitochondria. And the mitochondria, I think, are the most interesting organelles because they have their own DNA. You inherit them from your mother, and they can actually reproduce inside of our cells. So you inherit them because they are what is in the egg. The sperm that fertilizes the egg does not add its mitochondria to it. So you inherit it or them from your mother. They are in the egg. So actually, if you've done that 23andMe um, or something similar to that, like um, or some of the Ancestry.com or whatever, if you had your DNA analyzed, one of the things they do is they look at your type of mitochondrial DNA you have, and it's a classification, and then they compare it and they say where that um, is more common in the world, right? So they kind of compare your mitochondrial DNA if you're a female, actually even if you're a male, they compare the mitochondrial DNA, they look specifically at that. Okay, um, so men also obviously have their mitochondria from their, from their mothers. And the mitochondria can reproduce inside of the cells. So this all suggests that mitochondria are almost like organelles or organisms living inside of the cell, right? They're almost like parasites living inside of the cell. And there is a theory that is based upon the evolution of mitochondria, and this is called the endosymbiotic theory. And so if you look at this word, endo means inside, symbo, symbio means living together. So this is the idea that mitochondria and chloroplasts, I'll put mitochondria, and chloroplasts. Do we have chloroplasts? No, these are found in plants, right? Okay, so mitochondria and chloroplasts were once thought to be separate organisms. They're about the same size as, as bacteria, and they actually have their DNA is circular. So it's rings of DNA. So they don't have chromosomes inside of them. And they're about like maybe 37 genes. And those genes actually mutate much more rapidly than the DNA that is in your um, nucleus. And so the mitochondrial DNA actually mutates and changes more rapidly than the other DNA in your body. So this is the endosymbiotic theory, specifically for the evolution of eukaryotic cells. So I'll put that, I'll add that for the evolution. So mitochondria and chloroplasts are more like prokaryotic organisms because of the, their DNA and that they don't have any place inside of them. Okay. Chloroplasts also have their own DNA and are able to reproduce inside of the cell. Okay, so if we look at the function of the mitochondria in our body, this is where we aerobically produce um, ATP. So this is aerobic production of ATP. So what does aerobic mean? When you're exercising aerobically, you're breathing in a lot, but what are you getting a lot of? Oxygen. Okay, so this is in the presence of oxygen. So this is actually the whole reason why we need to breathe. 
you think about everything that we do, all the energy we spend, you know, all the time we spend breathing, all the time we spend worrying about breathing, we're not worried about breathing, right? The whole reason you take that breath in is to get oxygen into the circulation, into the blood, and then it diffuses from the circulatory system and then out into the space between the cells and then into the cell. And then it's not used anywhere else in the cell. It's used actually, okay, it's used in the proxosomes, but it's actually, most of it is used in the mitochondria. So this is where we produce ATP, right? So this occurs in the mitochondria. So what type of cells do you think might have lots of mitochondria? What cells in your body might have lots of mitochondria? What cells need a lot of ATP? Huh? Muscles, excellent, right? So muscle cells, right? They have lots of mitochondria in them. Actually, there are different types of muscle cells. The ones that are said to be oxidative, slow oxidative, have lots of mitochondria because they're using oxygen to produce ATP. Okay. We also have, as an aside, so I'll put here, we can produce anaerobic production. So we can produce um, ATP without oxygen. We do this in the cytoplasm of the cell. So the cytoplasm is the um, solution of water that contains all kinds of proteins and other things in it. So the cytoplasm is the space in the cell, right? And this is, it just occurs naturally through the production of enzymes in the cytoplasm of the cell. Anaerobic production of ATP, however, is less efficient and it produces a byproduct what does it produce as a byproduct that can be bad? So think about your, you're exercising anaerobically, you're lifting weights, right? You're never gonna be, be able to breathe a, in enough oxygen to produce that ATP to lift your weights. So what does, what do your muscles produce as a byproduct? Uh, lactic acid, right? right? So the has lactic acid. And this means that they fatigue easily. Right? So you produce lactic acid. Fatigue, they get tired easily. Okay. So the mitochondria are important for aerobic production of ATP. So if we look at the structure of the mitochondria, One of the interesting things is, is that we can look at what is called an electron micrograph. You're going to be looking at cells and using light microscopes today and on Wednesday in lab. This is using an electron microscope that has a much higher resolution, which means that we can see things that are much smaller. So you might see mitochondria um, like little black dots in your cell or dyed dots, purple dots. But you won't see this amount of um, uh, resolution, so the, the details. So this is actually a picture. What they do is they shine a beam of electrons down through the sample, and then the electrons come through the sample, and then um, they expose a piece of photographic film. So all of these are, you would never look directly through an electron microscope because there's no way you want electrons to shine into your eye, right? Um, so this is the way we, we image um, small things inside of the cells. And so this is my mitochondria, and they have enzymes specifically in that inner space that are really important in producing energy. Okay, so they kind of look like little bacteria, like rod-shaped bacteria as well. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about before we get to um, the plasma membrane is what is called the cytoskeleton. 
So our cytoskeleton is made of protein. So it's made of structural proteins. So this is important because it gives our cells their shape. For example, the cytoskeleton, cytoskeleton can um, attach to the outer membrane of a cell and create a specific shape, like red blood cells have a specific shape, like neurons have a specific shape, right? So they can give them their shape. Right, the shape of the cell. It can also cause some cells to contract. So can cause some cells to contract. The cytoskeleton is also important in intracellular transport. So intracellular transport of substances. And so our cytoskeleton is kind of like a set of railroad tracks. And um, substances can be transported down the length of the cell using the cytoskeleton. So for example, when we look at some of this of these as examples, an example is tubulin, right? This forms transport of substances. So we talked about how those vesicles that contain proteins can be transmitted from the Golgi apparatus, they travel through the cell to the outer plasma membrane where they are released. And so the interesting thing about this is, is that we also have motor proteins that essentially run along the tracks. And these motor proteins are just act like little motors. What we've discovered is, is that in the cell, we have these proteins that have mechanical movement and actually can change shape and, can, and allow them to move throughout the cell. So I'm gonna show you just a graphical depiction of what these motor proteins look like. And the really cool thing I think is, is that they're actually starting to um, use motor proteins um, oops, I lost it. They're actually starting to use motor proteins. Oh, here it is. Um, uh, in biotechnology. So think about how we might be able to, to create these proteins that actually move, and they might actually be able to move throughout your body, right? Nanotechnology, biotechnology um, to do things. Okay. So this is a vesicle. Right? This is my tubulin, this is my cytoskeleton, and this is my motor protein. So my motor protein can connect to my cytoskeleton, and this is my vesicle of, say, for example, milk protein. And it's just being transported right, to um, the outer plasma membrane where it is going to be secreted. Let's watch that again. Okay. So this is kind of a depiction of what the inside of the cell is doing. This is really important for neurons because neurons produce their neurotransmitters in their cell body and then they secrete them a long ways off um, at the ends of their um, axons. And so these motor proteins and the tracks, the cytoskeleton, are really important. And sometimes in Alzheimer's, um, one of the things that we find is, is the cytoskeleton gets messed up and it cannot do its work. And that's one of the characteristics of um, Alzheimer's is you get these tangles inside the cells where the cytoskeleton just becomes messed up and it doesn't work. So this is kind of related to, to um, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so other examples of these would include actin and myosin, which are in your muscle. These are muscle proteins. 
They aid in contraction of muscle, individual muscle cells, which then cause the whole muscle to contract. And then we also have another example of um, the function of a cytoskeleton. So a flagella, specifically in animals, this would be on the sperm, right? So the flagella is an extension of the cytoskeleton, which allows the sperm to move. So the sperm has its nucleus here, a mid piece, which contains its mitochondria, and it has the flagellum. Right? So the flagella would be a part of its cytoskeleton. So when you stain to look at the cytoskeleton, you see how extensive it can be. So this, these are in the cells. Um, the dark green would be the tubulin. The red would be surfactant and myosin. And then some other uh, fibrous subunits um, showing how extensive the cytoskeleton goes from top the cell. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the plasma membrane for today and Wednesday. And does anybody remember what lipid makes up plasma membranes? What is the type of lipid that is found in the plasma membrane? It has a head and a tail, and it's called a phospholipid, right? because it has a phosphate, lip, uh, phosphate group in its head, and it has these long chain fat, fatty acids. I didn't spell that right. Lipids, there we go. Okay. And this is called a phospholipid bilayer. So there's two phospholipid molecules and the tails are attracted to each other. We also have proteins, and this is the, the part of the fluid mosaic model. That's mosaic, I see, let me clean that up a little bit. That didn't look any better, sorry. Mosaic model of plasma membranes. So when they take a plasma membrane, they, they can take it apart, right? They can extract it, and they can analyze to see what type of organic molecules are in it. They knew there was protein in it, but they didn't really understand where the protein was. Was it like on the outside of the cell? Was it like on the inside of the cell? And what they came up with is, it, is actually proteins embedded in the membrane. And so mosaic means that there's many different proteins embedded in the membrane so they actually float around, okay? So many types of proteins floating around in your plasma membrane. So many types of proteins floating in plasma membrane. And so these proteins are actually really important. So we'll talk about the different kinds of proteins and what they do. The other thing about the plasma membrane is, is that it also contains cholesterol. So cholesterol is a steroid and it is found um, in the plasma membrane and it keeps the plasma membrane fluid, specifically at cold temperatures. So what they discovered is, is that some animals that can you know, be really cold, like fish in rivers in the winter, right, actually have more cholesterol in their plasma membrane than we do, for example. Some animals that hibernate, like squirrels or bears, when they, their body temperature cools down, they would also have more cholesterol in their plasma membrane 
because it helps to keep it more fluid when their body temperature cools off. So if we look at a diagram of what this plasma membrane looks like, this is it. So you need to know when I point to the phospholipid molecules, so the molecules with the head and the tails, that this is a phospholipid. These are the many proteins that are floating around in the plasma membrane, but they, they're not generally anchored or not necessarily anchored in one spot. Okay? Some of them go all the way through. Some of them are only exposed on one side. These would be what? What's that? Cholesterol, right? The four carbon rings. So those are the cholesterol molecules, so you should be able to identify them. And then we'll talk about these. These are glucose rings. And so this is a sugar that has been added to a protein on the outside of our cells. So our cells are actually sugar coated because those actually serve, um, they have an important role in, in um, self-recognition. So our cells are able to recognize each other and not specifically attack them and also coordinate um, activities within a tissue. Okay. So we're gonna be looking at the movement of substances across the membrane. And this means that our plasma membrane is semi-permeable. And what this means is, is that some things can cross it and some things cannot. So I also, I already mentioned that some substances can cross right across the plasma membrane. So I'll say that permeable too. One of these is water. So water, weirdly, can travel right across through that plasma membrane. Sometimes channels are added to the plasma membrane to make more water move, but water can move. The other thing that can move are lipids. So testosterone can diffuse right across the plasma membrane, get inside of your nucleus, interact with your DNA, and cause genes to be turned on. The other thing that can move are gases. So this would include oxygen and carbon dioxide. They can diffuse right across the plasma membrane. They do not need to be transported by a protein, for example. For example. So that means that there are some things that they are impermeable to, Large molecules. These would include glucose. Oops, doesn't want me to let me do that. Okay, like glucose, amino acids, etc. Okay, so glucose is not going to diffuse. It's not going to just move right through the plasma membrane. It has to have a channel through which it can move. And the same thing with the amino acids. The other thing that cannot move are charged particles. So for example, sodium and chloride cannot move directly across the plasma membrane. They have to have a special channel that goes through a protein. They cannot move across the plasma membrane. So substances will tend to diffuse. So for example, um, substances will move from a, um, a, a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So this is what is referred to as diffusion. This is the passive movement of substances from a higher to a lower concentration.
So passive means that it does not take energy. So that means that it's down or it's going towards its concentration gradient. Diffusion happens in non-living systems. So if you think about, if you had a beaker of water, for example, and you put a, a dye in it, so if you like put some food coloring in it, and you let it stand overnight, the dye molecules are gonna go from a state of concentrated in the center to diffusing out. And so it does not require a living system. Right. So it occurs in non-living systems as well. But you'll notice what happens is, is that in this particular instance, if these things are diffusing across, if these molecules are diffusing across, they're going to eventually re reach an equilibrium. And that, that equilibrium just tends to occur, right? And then in order to get it more concentrated on one side, you would have to use energy, you have to put energy into the system. So if you think about it, it would be impossible for me to say, okay, I want you to take all those dye molecules and put them back in the center of the beaker so that it's concentrated, right? There's no way to do that because that would take energy and some crazy skill, right? To be able to take it from being at the equilibrium to be back concentrated in the center. Now the movement of water is what is referred to as osmosis. So osmosis specifically is the diffusion of water. So in our bodies, we use osmosis, specifically in our kidneys, in order to concentrate our urine. So we actually reabsorb um, water from the filtrate that our kidneys make, and we concentrate our urine in that way, and so we can um, retain water. And so we'll, we're gonna look at osmosis today in today's lab. Okay, so we're gonna stop there for today, and we'll continue on our discussion of the plasma membrane on Wednesday, and I will find your quizzes.